All right, how's it going, every? Actually, I've read before. All right, how's it going, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Forward Thinking Founders, where we're talking to founders about their companies, their visions for the future, and how the two collide. Today, I'm very, very excited to have on the show Ben Tossel, who is the founder and CEO of MakerPad. Ben, welcome to the show. How's it going? Good. How's, how are you? I'm doing uh, fantastic. I feel like I've had some guests on around the no code realm in the last, you know, several months, but you're kind of like, you're the king of this. You're, you're, I feel like you're the leader of the no code movement. So I'm stoked to have you on. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for having me. I think, um, I was just doing it before it was cool. I didn't intentionally get myself as the no code person. I just happened to be that person when it was around. Well, it's funny. I remember, um, I remember, like, I, I followed you on Twitter, you know, I don't know, last couple of years, and you're totally right. Like, you, you know, I feel like it only, only got cool in the last, I don't know, like, year or so, but you've always been pushing this. Like, for, and people always gave you some, people always gave you flack for this no code stuff, but now the tide is shifting a little bit. <laughs> yeah, now it's definitely seems to be cool. Uh, yeah, when I was, uh, I was working at Product Hunt, and that's when I first started just, seeing all these different tools that I could use. So I started building with them and launching stuff with them. And then there would be, because of the the job, I, there was loads of developers who just thought it was shit and like not worth listening to and whatever else. Um, but then there was a good group of people on Twitter who just kept on asking like, how am I doing this? How am I doing that? How am I putting these together? Um, so I was just always doing it. I was never... I mean, I tried to code multiple times and failed. So I just, I was never going back to that. I was always just trying to figure it out and see how it, how it went. Um, and yeah, I guess here we are. Yeah, here we are. Um, and, you know, I definitely have more questions about what that was like and about kind of pushing against the current until the current was going your way. But to start, let's, um, let's just start for people that don't know who you are. They don't know my, they don't have much context. What is... MakerPad, what, what are you working on? So MakerPad is just a website where you can learn to build tools without code. Um, we phrase it in that you can build and operate businesses without code because on the one side, there's a lot of creators who want to build a side project, uh, want to start a mobile app, a, a membership site or something. But then there's a huge piece, which is like automation at work, automated processes in your day-to-day -day life that help save you tens, hundreds of hours. Um, so we, that's why we sort of say, build and operate businesses without code. I'm kind of curious, uh, I actually didn't realize that the, the, set, the second half of kind of your, your purpose or what you do, like build a, and start businesses and operate them. I'm curious, where do you see the split of interest in people in no code? Are there more people that want to hack stuff together just because they have that idea and they want to hack it together? Or are, are there more people that want to actually build companies and being able to use no code tools lowers the barrier to do that? Like, like where do you see the split? So I think there's a ton of people who have been in this um, sort of group of, yeah, I can't code or I can code really badly. I want, I've got an idea. I just don't want to spend nine months learning to code to then make a shitty version of it. So there's a huge um, group of those sorts of people who have now just realized, oh, I can build this in an hour or in a couple of hours on a weekend, whatever it is. So that's been an, the initial driver of this no code movement is all of these people realizing, oh yeah, I was that ideas person before. Now I can build it. And then really just shouting out from the rooftops about no code. So that's been a big push for the no code movement in general. Um, but we see a huge piece in that, like operating a business, like just think of so many processes that you do day to day, even with this podcast, you, if you're going to transcribe it, if you're booking guests, if you're like trying to pull my last, my top 50 tweets or something, just to have some context before we, we start chatting, all of those things that you can do without code. But I think the use cases of what, um, people are used to at the moment in this sort of early phase is, hey, now you can build a mobile app or now you can build this. It's not so much, and it's not as glamorous, the work stuff, right? But it's definitely a huge um, piece of the puzzle. It's so funny that you mentioned the podcast stuff because like literally, I'm definitely running on no code tools. Like, I mean, after, after we finish 
the podcast. I'm going to click a checkbox in Airtable. That's going to send you an automated email. They can you for coming on. It's going to change. Um, it's going to, it's going to trigger something in descript. And it's just like, uh, it's just the power of no code. Like I couldn't do this five years ago. And I, I, I do want to actually camp around there for a little bit. How, you know, Zapier has been around for a little bit. If this and that's been around for a little bit, you know, there's some of these, like you could build a websites like Squarespace and Weebly for, for quite a while. Um, so uh, I want your perspective on why did it just get cool now? Uh, or at least in the last year, I know it, it's been a little bit, but like what happened um, to make it all of a sudden the cool thing? Yeah, I mean, it was not by any means planned by anyone, I don't think, um, especially not me. I was just sort of sitting in that world um, doing what I was doing and it, and the rest of the world started catching up, I think, to listening around that coolness that you're talking about. Um, I think the tools just got so much better um, and people were shouting about how they could do stuff. And I don't know, I mean, I've said about this on previous podcasts, but I don't like the term no code and... It just it just so happens that that's the catchy marketing phrase that now everyone is using, and it looks like that's just what we're going to have to use. Um, but as soon as like a few big players start paying attention to that movement, that group of people, and start talking about that more widely, then it just sort of has a knock-on effect. So I remember last year when Webflow talked about their Series A it was such a big series a it was like 72 million and they were profitable anyway they're a great company they were f focused on designers a lot more before that but i mean i was using it as a no-code tool just like designers are probably would hate to see the back of what makeupad looks like because i've got div block 507 and whatever else like it, i don't use it the way a, a designer would but i think webflow really saw what people were building with with their tool, um, probably not their first use case, but then they've like they paid attention and now their whole focus or a big part of their focus is breaking that code barrier and not needing to code is now a big pushing point for them. So, something that I've noticed, and this could be dead wrong just because I'm not like as, as in the industry as you are, but it seems like there are two sort of platforms being developed, two categories of platforms in the no-code world, at least in this context. There's like the bubble, the boundless labs, the Adalo that allow you to build a full stack, you know, user login, you know, pretty in-depth apps. And then you got Webflow, which also allows you to build up some pretty in-depth stuff, but it doesn't seem to me like right now that they're, tr they're enabling you to build a apps you know full stack apps it's more of like front end experiences although webflow is probably the beefiest of them all um do you i guess why do you think web like are these different camps are they all going to converge at some point or just how do you feel about this difference between these two types of platform yeah i think they they initially had different use cases so webflow did start with designers in mind but now they've definitely paid attention and i think part of their series a or that such a large round was to push the product further and I think that eventually we'll be using Webflow to be able to build these full stack um, products too with memberships and everything else they they had a push into e-commerce last last year I think it was last year um, and obviously there's you can you can see things around that like a cart and orders and things that you think okay well surely there's going to be some sort of profiling system soon there's going to be like a login system soon um and I, I know the whole community is probably waiting for things like that but i know it's, it's definitely going to be on their horizon so it depends when when they decide to do that but i think a lot of tools will be more verticalized in okay you should use this one for marketplaces and this this tool is better for a membership site or or whatever it is i think um, that's bound to happen eventually yeah it, it makes sense um you know, I feel like I'm pretty well versed with no code tools. Uh, I, I built my last company on top of the, what I call the Watt stack, which is at the time Weebly, Airtable, Typeform, and Zapier, and scaled it up to uh, 25k a month. So like I like I know the power 
But I also feel like I know the limitations for now. And one of the limitations in my opinion, which I, I feel like there are solutions out there that I know about is like APIs. So I kind of am curious, what do you, what kind of tools do you see out in the, um, kind of out in the wild to help um, no code, I guess, developers, or whatever, you know, we're supposed to be called, go a level deeper and, and tap into APIs past Zapier functionality. Um, I guess I'll keep it a high level for now. Um, where do you see API tools being built for no coders like us? Well, I think there's, there was a new tool called no code API, um, came out, I think earlier this week, which just has loads of different ways you can use, um, the APIs like Airtable, Slack to build certain tools. We, I haven't had a play with it yet, but I know that, um, Tom who does our tutorials is definitely looking to do something there soon. Um, I think there's tools like standard library who we have a maker pad and they've got a few tutorials with us where they're not a no code tool by any means. I think it's probably more like a low code tool, but you, you can build something without needing to know how to code, but then within each of those steps, you can see the code that is produced and you could actually edit that code specifically. So it's like a, a, a like a muddy middle bit. Um, Parabola lets you pull in API endpoints and use that with um, Parabola's different um, functions and paths to pull stuff through, um, clean data, push it to other apps and things like that. And we've got a few examples on um, on that as well. So I think it's just the abstraction of it. I mean, if you have worked with Zapier a lot, Parabola and some of these other things, you almost start recognizing the patterns of what an API looks like. And you see it maybe an API like the Airtable one, for example, and then you realize, oh, that function or that class or whatever they call that thing is something that um, I've seen Parabola have a button for. And actually, I know now where that is and how to understand that. So it, it almost helps you understand a bit more structurally how the tech behind some of these things actually works. Um, and even a, a higher level is when you build a certain project with a, a front end, a back end and a database, you think of the no code version, which is like a web flow site. And then you have Airtable as your database and you have Zapier as your connectors. Like you, you still have these same pieces. So, um, it's interesting in that there's a lot, um, a lot of crossover if you want to go in, if you want to go down that road. And I think probably building with no code is one of the best ways to actually start learning to code as well. So there's this, you know, metaphor or analogy that I would say for you, which is you are ultimately, sorry about that. There are, you're ultimately, um, kind of drinking from the fire hose. Like you got, you got, you're kind of the, the head, uh, in my opinion, from like all the people that like aren't in it, you, you are kind of perceived as like the guy that's leading the charge on no code. Like, you you know, it's maker pad. And there are so many opportunities you, you could, you could capture so many things you could do in this pretty, you're in this pretty much like realm that you're pioneering or you're helping pioneer. How do you know what to work on and how do you know what not to work on with maker pad? Um, is do you, do you find it sometimes hard because it's such like a new frontier to know what to do? <laughs> yeah, I mean, no one knows what to work on. I mean, that's just a general like day to day. Like you said, there's there's so many things we could do, and so many things. I mean, we are doing a lot of things, and you'll see, you'll see <clears throat> in the next couple of weeks, there's going to be a lot of things coming out that we've been sort of heads down on over the holidays, trying to get out. Um, and I think no code has its advantages in that it helps us quickly build something. So um, we're going to be having our expert marketplace go live this week. And like it's taken us less than a week to, to create that. But also with no code, because it's so quick, it doesn't mean you should build these things. Like there are so many opportunities, but it's, it's just a case of, I think for us, build a good small version of this and put it out there and see if it works. So I know people think that we do launch a lot of things and a lot of the time it's just experimenting. It's just seeing is the market going to then pull this um, from our hands. We, we don't want to push things too much. We want it to be more of a pull. Um, if 
businesses find automation processes and using MakerCloud helpful, then we're looking at ways we can better serve businesses. If people keep messaging me every day and say, who's the best freelancer for me to hire for my no-code project? Maybe we should be doing the expert marketplace. So there's things like this that we get to see firsthand. And luckily, we're in a good position to see a lot of that stuff. Um, but I mean, I when I first um, sort of went full time with MakerPad, I was panicking that we were doing too much, and it was only only me then. And we tried to do a bit less, and then it became more about just doing just do tutorials. But then actually I've sort of gone full circle on that. I think we actually can do all of these things. We can do a bunch of these things and we can do them really well. So that's more of the focus of we're going to try and do this year is how many things can we be doing and how can we sort of be in all these areas of no code where people see us um, as being one of the main companies in this space. Yeah, it makes tons of sense. Um, I want to backtrack a little bit and just talk about MakerPad um, as a as a company, and uh, I guess go over some of the you know primary I guess functions of it, like uh, some of the I guess you could call it features, because um, I realized we we totally skipped that for people that don't know what MakerPad is, past or you know what you, what you said it was. So what are some things if someone goes to MakerPad.co, um, what can they do on MakerPad? What are some things that you've built in that'll enable people to, to, to do? So the main thing for us is tutorials and that's been just educating people on how to build certain types of things without code. So whether that is an Airbnb style app, an Instagram app, um, or even something that's helping you build a sales lead gen tool that automatically filters through different people at different stages. Um, automatically generating invoices with custom dynamic data on Google Sheets and all these types of things. So a big part of it is the tutorials. Um, we also work with companies like Airtable, Webflow, Bubble, who um, we work with on creating some like live workshops, tutorials, um, and really just helping them reach this no-code audience through, through all the parts of MakerPad. We have our tool marketplace, which we just recently updated that has like a multi-filter feature. So you can select customer support and another filter and it will just show you the tools that um, you should be looking at to, to do those things. We've had, we have that being extended into one big explore page basically. So soon, hopefully next day or so, you'll be able to do those filters and see what are the best tools in customer support, what are the best uh, tutorials and what are the user stories that we've got that we've interviewed people about so then you categorize all these things on one page um, and we're excited about that coming out we have some boot camps coming up in the next sort of few weeks which is we think there's basically three categories of people who come um, three stages more more or less which is the foundations of no code so Someone who doesn't know anything or just wants to just get started. What are the basics of the tools? What does Zapier do and how can I use it? What does Bubble do and how can I use it? Um, and then there's the building a business. Those people, there's a lot of those as we know. Um, so that's more of a practical use case of, okay, I want to build a marketplace. Here are several ways you can do that. Um, and then the third bootcamp is around automating at work. So, I do this repetitive task every single day and it takes me an hour a day. How do I build something with Zapier with whatever else to help me automate that process? Um, so we have, yeah, those sorts of buckets, which is where we're trying to do it. We've got a forum where people that sort of went live last week, people are posting stuff now and it's getting some good engagement. So we're going to try and put more public stuff there too. I want to dive a little deeper into your boot camps because um, actually that's just interesting for me as like a potential customer or user. So are these, are these like one day sessions where you just dive deep on like a webinar? Is it in person? Can you kind of get, give some more light into the boot camps and, and the, um, what they'll look like? Yeah. So we're going to be doing them remotely because I mean, that's just easier for our audience. 
And I think it'll be a sort of introductory day where we walk through some, almost like a presentation or a workshop of this is what you're going to learn in this boot camp. These are some practical things for you to come go and think about and maybe some things to prepare. And then we're going to have, I think it's four or five days and we'll do like a guided project for the first couple of hours and then have a break. And then people will go away and build their own projects. So it could be, okay, this is Tom teaching you how to build a marketplace today. Um, so in that two hour session, he'll build a marketplace in a Dallo. He could build one with Airtable and something else um, to show some um, different things like that. And then the customer will then go away and, and do their own version of that and they can get support and we can chat about it. And then we'll do like demos of those things. And I think that's how we're gonna run the first, um, the first iteration of the boot camps. Do you, do you see an opportunity in uh, just just in, in, in the world and in, in business for a something along the lines of YC like Y Combinator, but for uh, for no coders, kind of I guess in a way, kind of like what um, Ernest Capital and like Tiny Seed. Uh, well, I don't know. I feel like no one's doing exactly that. What do you think of a, of a VC starting to fund mainly no coders versus people that know how to code? Well. I don't know. I mean, I couldn't see it being VC um, territory because everyone building with no code is like stuck to a platform as they would see it um, and not building proprietary tech, which is what VCs, I think, a lot of the time like to see. But I think funds like Earnest Capital, there's a huge opportunity for um, something there where you could you could do like the um, revenue share agreements of okay you're building a business that brings in 20k a month I don't care if it's built all with no code tools it's the business that we're investing in and um, yeah giving support and, and things there and no code is just a means to the to an end right it's just like the way you put these things together I wouldn't know if half the the tools I use on the back end are using Zapier or using code so why, why would that make any difference for um, a, f a fund like Ernest, for sure? You, um, I I'm pretty sure that MakerPad is a portfolio company of Ernest Capital. And uh, I, I kind of want to go down this route for a second. Um, can you describe what Ernest Capital is and does and why you decided to you know, work with Tyler and become a company and go down that, go down that funding route? Yeah, so Ernest Capital invests in um, early stage companies. It's almost it's almost an alternative to VC. Um, it's basically funding bootstrappers, uh, people who've got maybe five to ten k, maybe sometimes less um, in recurring revenue a month, and then it gives you a little bit of funding and access to a, a big network of mentors who are also LPs in the fund. And yeah, you just have like weekly check-ins with other founders. So there's a sense of community. If you're a solo founder making 5K a month and you don't know what to do about X, you can ping people in the earnest um, network. And there's folks in there from loads of really good companies. Um, you can find all of them on their website and stuff. But they'll like jump on a call and help you through it. And they'll talk about like what they did in in their companies, how you can improve and it's more of like a support network rather than money for money's sake um there are investment terms they call a shared earnings agreement and i'll only butcher it if i try and explain what it is so i recommend going and checking it out but it's essentially you um you raise a bit of money from them and you there's like a payback term of three times or whatever it is of what they've invested um, and it's based on a revenue share agreement once you've hit a certain cap um, minus your founder's salary, which you agree. Um, and yeah, I think it was just great for us because it just allowed, I mean, we didn't need the money. It was revenue generating anyway, but it just given us a cushion of, okay, for the next 18 months, we know we can go full steam ahead. I can hire some, some folks to help me and we can really push this and see where we can get with it. Um, 
so that for me has been great and just being able to yeah chat with other founders in similar situations who may be solo founders trying to hire someone or trying to figure something out trying to figure out we've got loads of ways we could do things or there's loads of opportunities where should we focus um and just getting some feedback like that whereas um a vc back business is more i think you're perhaps given up the opportunity to run the business how you would like to run it and you've got to almost run it on someone else's terms so if i grew if makeupad grew three times in a year for me that would be fantastic for Ernest, they'd be really happy and a vc would think why didn't you go 30 times or why didn't you go 100 times like it just shifts everything a bit and i think for where I was as a founder and the mindset of, I don't want to like, you're essentially giving yourself a boss with a VC, I think where you've got to answer to their own, they've got their numbers they're trying to hit and you're one piece of that. Whereas Ernest was more founder friendly in my eyes um, in this scenario. So it's a long winded way of saying we're very happy with, uh, with what we chose and it's, it's going really well. Yeah, awesome. I remember when I saw, I believe someone retweeted Tyler's tweet about Ernest Capital, I don't know, like two years ago, three years, whenever, whenever it started. Yeah. And fa- I was just fascinated. Uh, like, what a, you know, speaking of pioneering movements and pioneering, like, wow, like that, I think Ernest Capital is the start of uh, something pretty big. Uh, probably a lot of people following them and starting firms similar um, for the better. I think I think it's a good model and a necessary funding model for founders. Yeah, I think we'll definitely see, um, co- I don't want to say copycats, but like people doing the same type of um, agreement. I mean, if I was going to start a fund tomorrow, I would just copy paste Tyler's uh, agreement with his blessing, of course, and change some some uh, language. But that's the sort of um, terms that I would want to invest my money on. Um, but yeah, I think, I think I'm going to see a ton more people looking that way and um, promoting the fact that bootstrapping companies is a good way to um, good way to run a business. I do think bootstrapping is becoming a little more a little more in style, even more than it was, you know, five years ago. Simply because you look at all this stuff with SoftBank and these big tech companies that are pretty much imploding. Um, and actually, yesterday or two days ago, I saw Atrium was laying off a bunch of. It's just like yeah. you know. Funding it doesn't seem like the sexiest thing in the world anymore, and like the fact that you can still get money and bootstrap your company, you know, it's somewhat contradictory. Like you know, it's it's the same realm. Um, I think that's powerful. Yeah, I think there's probably um, a slight divide in the bootstrap community where it's okay. Maybe people wouldn't say I'm bootstrapping because I've taken some funding, but I would argue that I bootstrapped it and I didn't need the money it's more like I've taken it on a different term and I met someone yesterday who was part of a company that took some funding and then grew to it was like they were at nine people then he grew to 60 people in six months and then back down to like 10 again because you get all this funding you think right we've got to grow really quickly we've got to hit all these crazy numbers and you just throw everything at it but then if you're bootstrapping and you've got 20k a month you think okay i'm paying myself 5 10k of that that gives me 5 10k extra to play with on something and maybe a little bit extra to pay um play around with some growth experiments or something like that so you you don't give yourself that option of okay i've got a million dollars i could just spend on uh i don't know let's hire 10 engineers um yeah, so it's a good it's a good mindset to be in, I think, anyway, for a, anyone running a business. Absolutely. And speaking of, you know, running, just anyone running a business, uh, you know, specifically for you, uh, I'd love to hear, I feel like, in my opinion, and if you disagree, I'd love to hear, but I feel like the first wave, or maybe like the first or second waves of no code have like come, and we're, you know, I guess we're in the middle of them, where it's like, People know the tools, people are learning the tools, and there's more tools that seems like being built every single day. Uh, if you had to guess or predict based on you know what you know, what would you say is the next phase for the no-code movement? Um, 
and yeah, I'll just, I, I guess I'll leave it there. Like what types of products are going to be built? What types of, you know, companies, you know, what, what's next for the no code movement now that the cat's out of the bag? Yeah, I think it'd just be more um, abstractions. So things like working with APIs, there'll be tools built on top of using the Stripe API or Airtable APIs in, that create simple verticalized um, companies. There's a company called Stacker App, which is based on an Airtable table, and they just have like a, a UI layer on top of that, which but it lets you log in, have a profile and post stuff to what essentially is an Airtable base, but the, the front of it doesn't look like that and it looks like a proper little uh, marketplace. So I think we'll see lots of little things like that come out. Um, and I think we'll see people like Webflow and bigger companies who just go into the more um, full stack um, projects where people can build a lot of these things in, in one tool. Um, and I think, I don't know, it's just up to the community. We just, everyone pushes things to their limits and we'll see what happens from there. But I, I've just seen a lot all the time nowadays. So, um, it's hard to see There's There's a cool company called obviously AI, which is doing some awesome things around data. Um, so I think, yeah, just things are going to get more and more powerful. So it'll be really interesting to see the next six, 12, 18 months, um, of what happens here. Do you ever think of yourself or or a future version of yourself as like an investor in some of these no code companies? I feel like you have the best deal flow of, of any person in the no code space in the world. Have you ever thought about investing? You know, once you st once, like if and when, or if not already, if you you're, you're making enough money to like cut you know however big of checks. I mean, if I had the money to be doing that, then maybe that would be an option. But I wouldn't like. I don't think I could be doing both. Like it seems a bit, um, a bit not unfair, but it's just a bit of a crossover. If I'm doing makeup ad and investing, I would have to focus on one or the other. Um, I'd love to be an investor in, in companies built with no code or, uh, no code tools. So potentially in the future that might be, um, might be where I have my thesis of uh, my no code capital, but yeah, not for now. No code capital. That that honestly that has an awesome ring to it. Better snag that domain before someone takes it. That's awesome. Um, well, and, and speaking of the future, uh, you know, speaking of looking forward, you know, I, I asked what's the future for the no code movement. Give me some like great answers. What What do you think is the future for for MakerPad? Uh, you know, the next five ten years. Uh, what direction are you are you rowing in? And I guess my, my, my real question is like in 10 years, if everything works and if you grow as fast as you want to grow and, and it all works out, um, you know, what does make your path look like in a decade? Well, I've had this question a few times over the last couple of days and the answer is I have no idea. Um, I mean, I can't, I can't predict what's going to happen in five years with no code tools and, and the market. And I'm not going to pretend like I, I know when I have a grand vision of, this is what we're going to be in five years. This is what we're going to be in 10 years. But what I see MakerPad is how, how do we look with maybe 10 people um, in the company and how do we look at with 20 people? And I haven't thought any further than that because we've got that mindset of we can do a lot with, a, with not many people. So we're trying to keep, keep that mindset and keep it close. But I think in our eyes, what GitHub is to developers, we want Makerpad to be for no coders. So we want you to be able to have your own profile where you can build up your own, um, yeah, you can build up your own no code profile. And that's where people go to find out about you, like a Dribbble profile. You'd have ways to hire the best people in no code. You'd have all the resources. Um, you'd be able to see all the use cases. You'd be able to dive into a podcast, be able to read blog posts and, and all that sort of stuff. I mean, there's tons of things we could do, but that's, that's the only um, sort of analogy I can give, which is, yeah, what GitHub is to developers, I think Makerpad will be for no coders. And this might be an interesting question, but uh, I'm kind of curious, when you're not thinking about no code and you're, and when you're not thinking about Makerpad, which I'm sure is, is most of your time in regards to work, but 
what else interests you? What else goes through your head when you're not thinking about those things just as a founder and as a technologist, you know, like uh, what else do you care about, you know, in the world other than a no code or make your bad? Um, I don't think about much else, um, which are probably, it's probably an answer for a lot of founders, but I think that's fine. I, a lot of the, um, secondary benefits of thinking about no code or working with no code stuff every day is like, how does everything become more productive or automated or something is like taken off your plate. You'd have to think about it so much. Um, there's tons of ways. I mean, I'm just starting a business. It was a side project for, for nine months or so. So now I'm just trying to figure out how do I run a good business? What are good business fundamentals? What are the principles we want to have as a company? And me personally, I've got, I'm getting married this year. So that's taken up a lot of time <laughs> as well. Um, so there's, there's always things going on. There's always lots to, to think about. So yeah, I'm not, um, I'm not trying to carve any time to think about much else at the moment. So you, you mentioned that you, you're now you this was a side project. Now, obviously it's, it's a full-time company. And you're just trying to figure out, you know, a lot of things, including business fundamentals. Um, I'd love to hear just since you, this was just a side project to now, um, what are some of those fundamentals that you've learned or just what have you learned along the way that you didn't know when you were just hacking this together as a side project? Well, I think there's benefits to thinking of your business as a side project sometimes in that, okay, can we do this thing? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, let's ship it. Let's get some, like, let's test it and let's figure it out as we go along. But when you have one, two, three people um, who work with you weekly, not every day you can wake up and be like, okay, well, today I'm going to do this. Um, what are you going to do? Yeah, that sounds good. Or no, do that thing instead. Like, I'd like to have a bit more structure and we've been working on this the last sort of, month or two is like what what are the themes that we're working on and where does Tom spend his time where does David spend his time where does Amy spend her time where do I spend my time and where do these pieces fit with the overall um, pillars of the business like what are our key objectives for this quarter and, and this year and what what are we aiming for so we've got some goals like internally and they're not five-year goals they're more like what do we look like in six months? Maybe what do we look like at the end of the year? But that's probably as much as we push it um, because things change. So yeah, we're just trying to think of processes and, and things in place and everything because we talked about how much stuff we do or could do. Our sort of philosophy there is it's actually okay for it to be completely manual to start off with when we test something as long as there's a path to get it automated as much as possible um, if it does work. So that sometimes is different for different people in different companies where it's like, okay, we'll ship this thing, but make sure it's automated as much as possible. But we've got some sort of free reign in that, okay, why don't we just start off with manual stuff and then automate it, which is maybe contrary to what it's like some of our tutorials are talking about as well. So, so you mentioned the beginning of this. I don't know if we were recording or not, but you were doing this no code stuff before it was cool, and then all of a sudden, it, it, the world caught up with you, and, and now it's really cool. I, you know, I, as mentioned, I've been following you on Twitter for a while, and I've seen some of the conversations, especially before it was cool, um, of, of you pushing no code and people just trying, just people saying you're wrong and like pretty, sometimes like pretty rude ways or ways that aren't, you know, aren't ideal. Uh, but you kept going and here we are now. I'd love to just hear, what was it like two years ago when you were pushing no code and you were just I mean, I don't know, I don't necessarily know the right word, but you were just potentially ridiculed. I'm like, no, Ben, like you're wrong. Like, how'd you, what made you want to keep going? And how do you just think about being a missionary and just sticking to your guns versus taking criticism and actually like listening to them? <laughs> well, probably on one side of it, it may be being a bit stubborn. I don't know. Um, I think it wasn't, I don't think I ever thought, oh, well, 
I'm doing this just to be different or just because I'm trying to push this no code movement. I was just like, I've tried to learn to code several times. I just can't do it. Like I can't figure it out. It's not for me. I don't want to go into coding boot camp. I want to do something else. I can't now. And then I was sort of a few years into my career in startup land. And then it felt like, oh, I've got to, if I wanted to do all that, it would be one path or the other. And I just think I'm just going to do it because this is the only thing I find that I can push myself and, and like go further on. Um, and I think there's a, an interesting thing that Ricky Gervais actually says when it's like, if someone's following you on Twitter and they're giving you shit for it, like that's up to me if I want to listen to it, block you, mute you or whatever. So his analogy is, it's like someone saying, um, giving you a flyer or just having, having a pin board up that says um, free guitar lessons. And you go up to people with that flyer and say, I don't like, I don't fucking want these guitar lessons. It's like, okay, we'll just ignore it. Like, if it's not for you, don't worry about it. Like I'm not chasing developers around Twitter saying learning to code was difficult. You must be like, whatever. I don't know. I can't even think of anything. It's just it's a waste of their time as much as it is mine. So if it was working for me, I'm just happy doing it. So I'm not, yeah, I'm not there to please anyone else. It just, just so happens that no code has sort of come around and people have seen the potential that I saw, um, a few years ago when, when I was like managing to make my own things where I just couldn't before. Do you, uh, you know, it's kind of, I, I've been on this thing in the last, I don't know, month, which the listeners are probably sick of it, but like, I'm still, I'm still on it, which is this difference between um, being a missionary and being a mercenary, like mercenaries see business opportunities they see dollar signs in, in their eyes and they're like oh i want to i want to i want to capture that business opportunity i want to start a business versus missionaries which is pretty much you where you're like you don't really care externally about what's going on you have your interest it's, it's intrinsic it's internal and you're just going to do that whether it's cool or not um i uh i'm kind of curious now that you you know that now that this no code movement has popped um are you seeing more people working on what they love now that they're able to build it? Or do you see more people searching for something to love through building different tools and tooling and whatnot? Um, I guess like what are the personas of people that are, that, are, that are building products and what are their like motivations or intentions? Well, first of all, first of all, I was definitely a mercenary probably until the last year, which, people probably don't realize, but I was exactly the same trying to figure out what is the idea that makes me money and makes me have a business. And I'm, one day I'll figure it out. And I didn't realize half the time that when I was putting out things without code, it wasn't the end thing that I was trying to, it wasn't the end thing that was going to get me this business idea or whatever else. It was actually the building without code thing. And that was just, like I said, a means to the end thing. What I was trying to start, a business and, and, and be in that camp. But yeah, in the last year, it's just so happened that I looked back and thought, actually, wait, it's that bit that um, is working for me and working for the business. Um, and there's always going to be people who are saying, how do you come up with ideas and everything else? And I can't say it any better than what you can find on the internet. There's just so many, even like yeah, YC Starter School and podcasts and blog posts. There's just so much stuff that will tell you about finding ideas or just fixing someone's problem and all that sort of stuff. So I'm not going to harp on about that because there's people smarter than me who've talked about it. Um, but I think no code helps you think, okay, I want to build, or I've thought about building like a little app for my personal trainer business. And now I can like, that's absolutely fine. If it's, if it's these people who are searching for ideas, just have businesses, I mean, that's also fine, but that's not necessarily going to get them the business that they're looking for. Um, if it's a means for just building things where you're interested and you want to learn how to do stuff, also fine. Like there's people do side projects all the time um, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's the practice of it. And I think no code does help you just do these things faster and, and you may be able to validate quicker. So maybe you can throw it away. And one big benefit 
I find with no code is that because you build it quicker, you're not as emotionally attached to it, so you can throw away it quicker. So if I've spent 18 months coding away on this thing that is Airbnb for dog homes and no one has like no one's interested in it whatsoever. I've got 18 months there that I'm still trying to push into people and shove down people's throats. Whereas if I built that in an hour, two hours with no code, put it out there and then like no one liked it. It took me a couple of hours and I learned how to build a certain type of thing with glide or something. So I can just say, right, well, let's throw that. It didn't work. It was a bad idea. Um, and that's one of the a really big sort of underlying benefits, which I don't know that many people realize at the time. It's, it's a way to validate and, and also a way to throw away a lot of your ideas. So you mentioned that you don't like the term no code, but that is just what has kind of stuck. And that's been what it is. If you had the power, which I feel like you still do, but it, it, let's say you had the power or have the power to change what people call it and cha change the movement name. Uh, do you have any idea what you would call it or, or you know, what you would replace no code with? I have absolutely no idea. And people have asked me. Um, I, I don't like any of the terms that are out there, like visual developer and things like that. I just, I don't like any of them. But it's, it's not about it being no code. So if I went to my brother and said, oh, you know, you can build um, an app for your personal training business without code. He was thinking, he's probably thinking, well, I wasn't even thinking about it with code. I was just thinking like build an app and it's not the with or without thing at the end. But at this moment in time, there's a big group of people who, who are fo focusing on that, which is fine because that's sort of how it's helped this movement get along. But yeah, it's not, yeah, it's not having those with or without code on those search terms. It's just the build this thing. I, uh... So I, I actually agree with you. I don't love the, the term no code either. I think it, it, it's not, I mean, this is very like marketing minded thing to say, but it's not like super brandable. It's like no code, you know, it's just like what it is. I'm curious. I, 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 ha, I have a, I had a thought um, on what could potentially replace it. And I, about like six months ago, I was considering like doing something with it. But, like I did nothing, but what are your thoughts on tooling? Like, tooling something together like i know retool is kind of or it's our kind of their thing but no one ever talks about tooling what do you think about tooling as a replacement just off the cuff yeah well i i always refer to a lot of these as like tools and i talk about them as tools or um i just even saying tools that many times in one sentence has made me like now realize it sounds really weird but that's i mean same with every word so i don't know that it's like i don't know i think you can't brand a movement. You can't like, think of a, an alternative. It just is what people refer to it as. Um, no code is no code. And unfortunately, neither me or anyone else, I don't think will be able to change that right now. And it's just what we've got to live with. I just make sure I keep on saying it on every podcast, how I'm not keen on it. Well, I, I do think that, in a decade, it won't be no code. It'll be something else. I, I, I think I think something will happen or not. We'll see. Well, we are coming close to the end of the podcast. I appreciate you coming on and jamming about about no code um, and whatnot and, and what you're building with MakerPad. Just a couple more questions before we wrap it up. Um, if someone wanted to, if someone was listening and this is the first time that they heard about no code. And they, they, they're like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. Where do I start? Do you have a specific tutorial or place on your website that you would suggest for like someone who's brand new to all of this to just dive in? Where would you suggest they go first? More specific than just makerpad.co. Where would they go? So this isn't, we haven't got a good answer to this, which is what I'm currently building, which is that explore page. It's not even live yet. I mean, when someone listens to this, it may be. So feel free to go to makepat.co slash explore and I'll see, you'll be able to see if I've done it or not. Um, but essentially, yeah, we want to have things bucketed into like the foundations, which is the basics or 
um, building a business or automating at work. And we think they're the three main buckets that you should be able to jump into really quickly. Um, but if there's something you're thinking about, the best thing is like jumping off forum, jump on Twitter and ping me or Tom and just ask because more likely than not, we'll be able to just point you in the right direction straight away. But I agree with you. There needs to be an easy way to go, like come across, make a pattern and think, okay, sounds good and everything. Where is like, how do I just jump in at the very, the very ground level? Um, and that's what we need to be better at. And my last question for you is you are building a company. You're, you're pretty early stage still, which means you can use a lot of help just like any early stage company. And you got all these people listening that know this question is coming that want to help and, and, and want to help you kind of further make your pets, you know, vision and mission. Uh, what is an ask that you have for the forward thinking founders community and just how can we help? Well, we're always looking for companies to work with, and helping them automate processes. So if we can just do that and get referred, introduced and say, right, there's something we do repetitive, how do we automate it? I'm pretty confident that we can do that without code. And we just wanna have like a huge library of use cases of people using no code to automate processes, to build tools and just show off about that. So. Yeah, any intros to businesses, even founders that do that sort of stuff, I'm sure we can help. All right. Well, that's a wrap. Ben, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. Really appreciate it. And best of luck with MakerPad. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. It's been, uh, it's been good.